This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Uh, today, uh, we are in our second to last week in this series uh, in the Gospel of Mark. It's called The Kingdom Come, The Gospel of Mark and the Secrets of God's Kingdom. And I'm going to do a big section of Scripture today and a really small section tomorrow. Uh, if you remember for Good Friday and Easter, Pastor Jan and I preached at the end of chapter 15 of Mark, and we preached chapter, he preached chapter 16 on Easter, so... I'm filling in that space of chapter 15 that has not been preached yet these next two weeks. Um, so after that, we will be starting a series um, on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we're excited to enter into that after a long season in Mark. Uh, but today, Mark is still great. Uh, we're going to uh, open up the Word in Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 27. Uh, Mark 15, verses 1 through 27. Please follow along as I read the word of God. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there is a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to re release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to get, have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let me pray over the preaching of God's word. Heavenly Father, uh, we praise you this day uh, that Jesus has gone before us to the cross. Uh, Lord, we thank you that though we are undeserving, undeser uh, in his love for us, he marched forward. He faced unjust trials. He faced scourging, mockery. Uh, he faced injustice. Uh, to a degree that we can never comprehend, uh, with him being righteous uh, and unworthy of such treatment, Lord, he went to the cross and bore uh, not just um, the punishment from the authorities, uh, scorn from man, 
But Lord, he bore that moment where you turned your loving gaze from him. Uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ faced uh, this trial uh, alone. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that because of him, we can always look to you as Father, Lord. Uh, we thank you that it's by faith uh, in the works of Jesus that we are saved and not our own. Lord, as we look to Jesus bearing his cross today, let it give us joy, uh, a sense of honor, a sense of praise and worship to bear our cross for him each day as we go forward in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, I just read a really serious, challenging text, um, but I do want to begin by saying it was a really exciting week in Boston this week. And why was that? Um, there's not that many people wearing green in here today. Last service, we had a lot of green. Uh, it's, you guys are different congregations sometimes. Uh, but um, why was it an exciting week? The Celtics, the 2023-2024 Boston Celtics, uh, closed out the NBA championship series uh, four games to one, uh, beating the Dallas Mavericks. And so for the 18th time in franchise history, the Celtics were crowned champions, and they're world champions, even though it's really just the American championship. Um, and, uh, but I, I understand that, that uh, cry when my teams win. Um, and what a week it was, uh, especially for those who are local fans, locals uh, who've been craving a championship since the last one in 2008. Um, and uh, watching the win uh, is something that was very exciting. Uh, but really, I, I think the best part when my team wins, when the home team wins, is when the fans, the coaches, the players gather after the game downtown in the city to celebrate the victory. And so we got to watch them close out the series. We got to see the parade. And uh, um, local news sources say one million fans, one million people showed up uh, to the parade that took place between TD Garden and Heinz Convention Center. And that's, that's hard to fathom. I know from social media that a lot of you were there and enjoyed yourselves. Um, I have to admit, I did not go. Uh, I uh, had to take care of my children, do my job, and um, I have to admit, I'm a Philadelphia 76ers fan, if any of you know basketball history. They're actually a rival of the Celtics. There is a true rivalry, but if I'm honest with myself, it's not a rivalry at all, because the Celtics historically are a lot better. Uh, but um, I didn't go to the parade, uh, but even as a Sixers fan this week, I was really happy for my, my friends who follow the Celtics. Uh, I intentionally looked up videos to see how the game, closing game went. I intentionally watched videos of the parade uh, to take in the excitement and just watching the parade, seeing a few people heading to the parade with their uh, Kelly green and their painted faces uh, really just boosted my spirit. Uh, it really made me excited. Generally, I love to see teams and individuals raising a trophy, raising a medal uh, at the end of a long season of hard work, going through the trials and triumphs uh, in pursuit of a goal. Um, I love the confetti, I love the duck boats, to see the camaraderie between teammates and coaches and fans. Um, I'm happy to see almost any professional team lift the trophy, uh, except the Dallas Cowboys except the Mexican national soccer team, as a USA soccer fan, um, except uh, Russians at the Olympics. I like the Russian-American rivalry um, at the Olympics. Uh, but uh, I, I do love to just see these moments. Um, and as I watched uh, these videos this week, uh, I couldn't help but think about victory. Um, why do I like to see people celebrate victory? I uh, just genuinely was brought to that question, and uh, because it's really not my victory, it's really 12 guys on a basketball team, uh, their victory, uh, and the, those involved in the franchise. Uh, but uh, I, why do I like to see people um, celebrate victory? Because I won it in my life. Uh, I like to see teams, almost any team, celebrate ultimate victory because I get to experience a taste of it. Uh, vicariously through them. Uh, and it isn't, um, 
It's amazing how powerful just getting a taste as a fan, or even me, not even a true fan of the Celtics, just how powerful it is to just lift one's spirits, to get them happy, to forget about whatever present trials they're facing, forget about the ups and especially the downs of the season that uh, they endured to get there. Uh, and it's, it tastes so good, the emotions, the joy, uh, the praise and worship that it leads to. Uh, celebrating victory is amazing, and I, I want more of it. Um, and I, as I processed all this, I couldn't help but ask, what does victory mean for me? Um, as much as I wish that I could pursue victory as a professional athlete in my late 30s, and there's no hiding it. You hear me talk about sports so much, like I'm reliving my three years of athletic prowess between high school and college often. Um, I, I really do wish I was a professional athlete. Um, but God did not call me to that. Um, I honestly asked, uh, what, what does victory look like for me uh, as a Christian? Uh, for the core part of my identity, what does victory look like? Uh, what does success in the Christian life look like? What does a victorious church look like? And what do these questions and this reflection on the Celtics trophy lifting and parade have to do with our text? Uh, as I meditated on the text this week and studied it, I found out that so much of this text is actually focused on victory. Uh, even though we have Christ being uh, facing unjust trial, even though we have him facing scorn and mockery and torture, uh, we see Christ uh, secure his victory over Satan and sin and the opponents of his day. Uh, in this text, I argue today that we see the events uh, that lead up uh, to Christ's coronation as not just King of the Jews, but as Son of God, Lord of all. Um, so what does victory look like for me? What does victory look like for you, for us as individual disciples of Jesus, for us as a church? Uh, to find that out, I'll break the uh, analysis of the text today into two sections. And uh, no, I'm fighting off a lot of scripture today. I'm not going to walk through verse by verse. You'll see I do cover the, a lot of the text. Uh, but as I cover two points today, I'm going to focus on the coronation of Jesus and how the text brings that out and the coronation of a disciple. So first, the coronation of Jesus. So as I've been talking about, this text does have a lot to do with uh, the Celtics' victory and their parade because it focuses on Jesus's coronation, him being crowned king. Uh, it's a text in which he's installed as king of the Jews. Uh, it's not super clear on the surface. I think on the surface, we do see this theme. Uh, it's, we see Jesus uh, mentioned, acknowledged as the king of Jews five times in our text. People either ask him if he is or say that he is five times in verses 2, 9, 12, 18, and 25. Uh, but further, we re as we read on the, in the chapter, uh, not in the part of the text that we read in verse 39, uh, the pinnacle moment, uh, the climax of the book of this chapter in the book of Mark is actually in verse 39, where a Roman centurion, the least likely person of that day to proclaim Jesus Christ as, uh, as king, um, he goes on to uh, pronounce at the foot of the cross after observing Jesus' last breath and probably this whole process from trial before Pilate through Christ's last breath on the cross. This centurion proclaims, truly this man was the son of God. And so uh, the son of God, that's an even greater title than king of Jews. It's in reference to Jesus as the God-man, the one who is fully God and fully man, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one who fulfilled the scriptures by living a sinless life, by dying the death that we deserve on the cross and rising from the grave. Uh, we don't see that yet in the text, the resurrection. Uh, but these titles, the text applications in Mark 15 of these regal titles to Jesus, uh, serve as indicators that we're actually talking about Jesus uh, being installed as king here in this chapter. It's about his final victory over Satan and sin, um, and therefore him 
positioning himself to uh, sit at the right hand of God the Father in heaven upon his ascension. Um, and so how, just further, we see broadly this text engage uh, this topic of Christ's kingship, um, but more specifically, where do we see it? Um, to understand that this text, what this text about is about, to understand it's about the coronation of Jesus, uh, you have to understand what irony is. Uh, you have to understand the literary device of irony. I have to take you back to middle school or high school English composition or literature class to understand this. Uh, because Mark, the author of the text, uses a lot of irony, dramatic irony, specifically. Uh, what is dramatic irony? It's a literary technique by which the full significance of a character's words or actions are clear to the audience or reader, although unknown to the character. So let me say that again. What is dramatic irony? It's a literary technique by which the full significance of a character's words or actions are clear to the audience or reader, although unknown to the character. So while, in summary, uh, I'll get brought, put broadly, the, the Jewish authorities and Roman authorities in this chapter think that they're quashing the idea, the truth, the fact that Jesus Christ is king of Jews. And all that they do, they think they're quashing that idea um, but they're actually establishing him as king of the Jews, Lord of lords, son of God, through their actions. Uh, so Mark uses a lot of irony through this section of scripture. Uh, and time and time again, uh, this passage shows us that the actions or words of the characters engaged in Jesus often said or done in order to ridicule him and deny him the kingship that he claims actually served to establish him as, in his kingship. Um, so the Jewish authorities mentioned in verse 1, uh, Pilate, the Roman governor who sentenced Jesus to scourging and crucifixion, mentioned in verses 2 to 15. The Roman soldiers at the governor's headquarters in verses 16 to 20. The Romans at Golgotha, uh, where Jesus Christ was crucified uh, at the end of the section, 21 to 27. Uh, these characters actually serve to establish Jesus as king instead of deny him the kingship that he claims. Uh, so while the characters scorn him, engage him with indifference, beat him and mock him, crucify him, they establish him as king. And so I, I'm a little repetitive on there, but I want to hammer it home. So how do I see this irony? Uh, where do I see this irony in the chapter? Uh, just further it. Uh, in more detail. Uh, we see this uh, first because this chapter uh, really emphasizes Jesus' silence and passivity of action. So in verse 2, Pilate asks Jesus if he is the king of the Jews. Uh, he gives him a short kind of ambiguous response of, you have said so, and then says nothing else in the rest of the passage. Uh, even beyond these verses, in this chapter, Jesus says very little in this Good Friday narrative compared to other Good Friday narratives uh, mentioned in the other uh, Gospels, uh, Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, we, we have Jesus saying a lot less to Pilate here in Mark. We have Jesus saying a lot less um, on the path to the cross. We have Jesus saying a whole lot less uh, when he, to God um, on the cross. Uh, and so Jesus, essentially, he deny, doesn't deny his claim as king of Jews at the start of the chapter and then he silently takes his persecution and torture. Uh, his silence is profound. Uh, however, the word, words of his persecutors and the description of their actions, they fill the chapter. The word they dominates the sections of verses, one, the two sections of verses 1 through 27. Uh, the word they is used 19 times in this passage. Uh, they is used five times with regards to the Jewish authorities as they make accusations against Jesus before Pilate in verses 1 through 15. They is used 14 times in verses 16 to 27 with regards to the words and action of the Roman soldiers. Uh, so as we meditate on this, we see that this passage of Scripture centers around what the Jews and Romans, what they did in order to mock and persecute Jesus for the, his claims to be king. Ultimately, they, the Jews, 
unjustly find Jesus guilty of blasphemy in the religious court and therefore sentence him to death. After the Jews who don't have the right to carry out execution, uh, bring him, they bring him, Jesus to Pilate. Ultimately, they, the Romans, Pilate and the soldiers, find Jesus guilty of treason, sentence him to death, and uh, execute, carry out his execution. While the text seems to suggest on the surface and the words uh, and actions of Jesus' persecutors seem to j suggest that Jesus has lost, he's not showing himself to be king of the Jews. Ironically, all of the actions of they uh, establish him as rightful king of the Jews. So while Jesus is being mocked and scorned, it's actually, and crucified, it's actually a glorious moment for him, for all of us who have faith in him. Uh, his silence here isn't golden, it's glorious. Uh, everything that has happened here while Jesus was silent and submissive in the face of injustice served and proved to be the means through which God the Father actually coronated him, installed him as king. Uh, so through much irony, Mark shows us how the Jews and Romans who killed Jesus uh, actually present, established him as king. And uh, I, I want to keep going with this to clarify. If you're still not with me, let's reconnect what I'm saying about this text to the Celtics' victory in their parade. What did we see this week? We saw them win the final game, and we saw their triumphal procession, the parade in the center city, the ceremony in which they were installed to be NBA champions before their home crowd. Uh, this kind of gathering should remind us, if any of you know history, you would have heard of uh, Roman triumphs, Ro Roman triumphal processions. If you go to Rome today, you see where these processions took place. Uh, I've been there. Uh, there's the arches that commemorate these, these processions. Uh, there's one uh, built uh, to honor the, the procession of AD 71 when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, the Ar Arch of Titus. Uh, so the Romans were famous for their triumphal processions after great victories of war, uh, great war campaigns. Wikipedia explains it well. Uh, you don't have to go far to get a proper uh, description. The Roman triumph was a civil ceremony and religious rite of ancient Rome held to publicly celebrate and sanctify the success of a military commander who had led Roman forces to victory in the service of the state or in some historical traditions, one who had successfully completed a foreign war. On the day of his triumph, the general wore a crown of laurel and an all-purple gold-embroidered triumphal painted toga, wore regalia that identified him as near divine or near kingly. In some accounts, his face was painted red, perhaps an imitation of Rome's highest and most powerful god, Jupiter. The general rode in a four-horse chariot through the streets of Rome in an unarmed procession with his army. Cap with his army captives and the spoils of his war. At Jupiter's temple on the Capitoline Hill, he offered sacrifice and the tokens of his victory to Jupiter. Uh, first in the procession came the captive leaders, allies, and soldiers, those who were conquered, usually walking in chains. Uh, some were destined for execution or further display. Their captured weapons, armor, gold, silver, statuary, and curious or exotic treasures were carted behind them along with paintings, tableau, and models depicting significant places and episodes of the war. Next in line, all on foot, came Rome's senators and magistrates, followed by the general, general's lictors, his top security, in their red war robes, their fasces wreathed in laurel, then the general in his four-horse chariot, a companion or a public slave might share the chariot with, his, with him, or in some cases, his youngest children. His officers and elders son, elder sons rode horseback nearby. His unarmed soldiers followed in togas and laurel crowns, chanting, Io Triumphe, and singing songs of a se sexual nature at their general's expense. Somewhere in the procession, two flawless white oxen were led for the sacrifice to Jupiter, garland decked and with gilded horns. All this was done to the accompany, accompaniment of music, clouds of incense, and the strewing of flowers. So what this text is here in Mark 15, it's actually a depiction of Jesus's ironic triumphal procession. What the book of Mark is as a whole is a depiction of Jesus's ironic triumphal 
procession as a suffering servant of God. The book starts acknowledging Jesus' humble beginnings, his life as a carpenter's son, his vocation as a carpenter until the age of 30 when his ministry began, uh, his ministry that took place outside of the uh, area of religious authority, uh, his humble uh, life. And uh, although Mark chose, he chooses in this chapter particularly to bring out just the, the nature of, of Jesus's triumphal procession. And it's the complete opposite of what anyone would have expected in a triumphal procession. But because of this element of you have Jesus traveling from one part of the city to another, you have Jesus walking through a city with crowds around him. You have Jesus uh, mocked in royal robes then have them taken off. You have Jesus wearing a crown of thorns. All of these details would have been triggers to Mark's original audience to see that the author is trying to show that some sort of triumphal procession is happening. The irony is it's the exact opposite. It's not, by worldly standards, one of victory and success. Uh, but one commentator says, although emperors declared their lordship and deity in many ways, none was more dramatic or intentional than the imperial triumph. Mark, however, viewed Jesus' walk to the cross as an even greater triumph. He depicts this through the use of irony. Um, so how is this irony shown in the text? More, most specifically, uh, let's think about the details of Jesus' walk to the cross and compare it to the typical uh, triumphal procession of a victorious Roman general or emperor. Uh, Jesus is not paraded through the streets of Jerusalem as a conqueror, but as a convict, a victim of injustice in two court systems. That's where the text begins. Jesus is not paraded through the city as a conquering emperor or general with his army, but as a religious teacher abandoned by all of his followers. Jesus was not led in procession into the most influential place of government and religion in the city, but was led out of those places, out of the high religious and government uh, place of authority, outside the gates of the city to a place of death and shame, Golgotha. Jesus wasn't paraded through the city in a fancy chariot, but he was forced to walk out of the city walking on his own bare feet, absorbing the scorn and mockery of the people while carrying a cross, the symbol of death and shame. It would be the same as someone carrying an electric chair uh, through the streets today. At the end of his march, Jesus didn't step up onto a podium with the highest ranking leaders next to him to be seated on a throne and treated like a god, but was raised to a high place, naked, on a cross, with two insurrectionists placed beside him in order to be derided and mocked. Uh, Jesus uh, the, um, did not, history also shows that uh, when an emperor or general reached the end of his procession and got near the, um, got near the temple, uh, they would be given a glass of good wine. Jesus was given a glass of bitter wine mixed with myrrh. And so do you see the irony? There's a procession happening, but everything that's happening is just the exact opposite of what should take place during a triumphal procession for a king. Uh, however, the experience, Jesus' experiences of all these things established him as the king. And again, like all of these things are things that one might expect a Jesus follower would want to downplay. Uh, if they're trying to convince someone to believe in Jesus, uh, the, the victor, why would they want to share these details? Following just the, the flesh, we want to see victors. We all think that a victor should look like the 12 Celtics standing on the top of a duck boat with, with all the regalia, with the trophy, uh, with the nice clothes, with the people cheering. Why would anyone try to tell someone to place their faith in a man who died at the hands of both the religious elites and the elite, political elites of his day. But Mark, however, he, he didn't avoid these details. He did the opposite. He highlighted Jesus' great accomplishments as Messiah. Uh, those great accomplishments were his sufferings, his cross. 
And so why is that the case? Why did he highlight these? Uh, why did he highlight these demeaning, painful actions that Christ experienced to show his kin kingship? Uh, the, the answer is that everything, we need to believe this by faith, that everything takes place in Mark, um, especially in this chapter, as God intended. Uh, we're seeing his plan to coronate Jesus as king played out in history. Uh, we believe all of this is happening from a viewpoint of God's sovereignty, that God through providence planned for his Messiah to come and uh, earn his place on his throne by stepping into these actions. Uh, what happened on Good Friday was not a series of unfortunate events, but it was God's plan. Uh, this is what God intended to happen. This is what God, what needed to happen in order for Christ to be our perfect Savior and Lord. Uh, and how do we know that? Because the entire event had already been prophesied. Uh, it was prophesied by Jesus three times in Mark's gospel in chapters 8, 9, and 10. There's uh, quotes from Jesus, uh, Mark 8.31, the first one, he says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Uh, along with these three predictions, when he uh, sat with his disciples for the Last Supper, where he would give his body and blood, memorialized in the bread and wine of the meal, Jesus was prophesying about how he was going to die. Uh, how do we know further uh, that this was God's sovereign plan uh, to coronate Jesus? Um, Jesus didn't just prophesy it, but the Old Testament prophesied it. Uh, let's take Jesus' silence before the Jewish authorities and Pilate during the trial proceedings. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Let's take the mockery of this chapter, Psalm 22, 7. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. Consider the parting, uh, splitting of his garments, the casting of lots in verse 24 of our passage. Uh, Psalm 22, 18 says, They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Uh, consider that there were two thieves hanging on Jesus' sides. Uh, Isaiah 53, 23 says, He was numbered with the transgressors. So this whole event uh, happened uh, exactly as Jesus predicted, exactly as the scriptures, uh, all of these scriptures basically written a thousand years or so before Jesus walked the earth uh, and experienced this, all of this happened by God's will. This was God's plan to coordinate his king, the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, the text further uh, shows us that this was God's plan when it says in verse 25 that Jesus was crucified in the third hour. So that's 9 a.m. in the morning. Their day started at 6 a.m., uh, so three hours after that, 9 a.m. Later in the chapter, we read that uh, he was crucified at the third hour. And then in verse 33, it says, at the sixth hour, it became dark in the land. And then in verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus died. Jesus died at three in the afternoon. So he's only on the cross six hours. It was from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, most crucifixions, they ended, they, they would go on for days. Uh, why did Jesus crucifixion uh, go so quickly because the late other scriptures tell us that uh, Jesus, when it, three hour, in three hours of darkness, the wrath of God poured out over him, and that was all the eternal punishment that was needed uh, to be poured out for the sins of all of God's children, for all of history. And Jesus shouted out in victory, it is finished, uh, and he breathed his last. Uh, but this schedule, this text has this clear schedule uh, because it's shown everything's going according to time, according to God's plan. Why at 3 p.m.? Because that's the time of the evening sacrifice. Uh, every morning and every evening, the Jews sacrificed the lamb as a burnt offering. Um, so Jesus, here is that offering. Uh, God is clearly trying to show us uh, through Mark's writing that everything's happening according to uh, to his schedule. 
Uh, so what appears you know, to worldly wisdom to be a mistake, uh, that this, this mistreatment of Jesus uh, was a mistake, it's, it's actually God's sovereign plan. Uh, so how did Jesus become king? The Lord, his father, ordained it that the road that led to the cross was the path to make him king. It was through this way. Uh, we could say, uh, one, as one uh, theologian says, that this was his installation service as the king of kings. So the soldiers scourging him, spitting on him, the soldier striking him was a part of God's liturgy, his order of service for Jesus' coronation. Uh, so Jesus' crown, it's a cross. Jesus' throne, it's a tree. Uh, from a human standpoint, the Romans crucified Jesus. But from a divine perspective, the Romans crowned him as king when they nailed him to the cross. This is all according to God's plan and will. Uh, and how opposite is this the way that we think? Uh, we don't think that victory could ever come from such travesty, but this is what we're talking about in this whole series, the gospel of Mark and the secrets of God's kingdom. Christ shows up that the way down is the way up, that in our humiliation, he is exalted. In his humiliation, he was uh, exalted. When we are similarly humiliated, he is exalted. We are exalted. Um, when we step out in the inadequacy of our own strength is when God's power is shown. Uh, why does God work like this? Scripture's answer is because his ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. This isn't the wisdom of man. This is foolishness to man. The preaching of this is foolishness to man. That God could save and soften a hardened heart that hates him through the preaching of this is foolishness to man. But it's God's wisdom. And when you grasp it, it's amazing that he could use such travesty to, establish, to fulfill the scriptures of a, his plan to send a Messiah that would come and satisfy his law and in his death bring about victory over Satan and sin for all of his children. That's, that's just amazing uh, when you pause and think about it. Um, when we look at the cross, uh, what do we gain? We gain the proper view of Jesus. Uh, he becomes our sacrifice, the sacrifice in our place. The penalty for sin is death. Uh, he is our sacrifice. It's his blood poured out. Um, he becomes our propitiation. He takes on the wrath that we deserve. Uh, the, the punishment against the holy God is eternal wrath against sin. Uh, Jesus bore the wrath, the anger against sin uh, in our place on the cross. He becomes our redeemer. When that wrath is paid, nothing fully paid, nothing else needs to be paid. We don't have to live in the guilt and shame of our sin anymore. We get to walk three, freely in the love and joy and peace of God. And that's, that's just what ultimate freedom is. Uh, and thank God when we look at the cross, he becomes our king. Uh, he shows himself to be beyond the wisdom of the world. He shows his power ultimately to rise from the dead a few, day, a few days later on Easter. Uh, and he ascends to the Father where all authority in heaven and earth has been given him. So when we look at the cross, view it as his cor Christ's coronation, um, what should our re response be to all of this? Um, that God could use such a travesty for his glory. Um, what does the Celtics' victory in their parade inspire in us? Praise and worship, right? We're getting into the secret wisdom of God, the Trinity. Uh, we're seeing how he has orchestrated all of history and in our individual lives around this moment. And we should be taken up with amazement. You think of the Apostle Paul in Romans, oh, the depths and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. 
For who has known the mind of the Lord, who, or who has been his counselor? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. That's what our hearts should be brought to as we look to Jesus, our King, being coronated here through such travesty. Uh, biblical worship, it should always be cross-focused worship. Uh, it should lead to us approaching Jesus not just as a friend, not just as someone we call on when we're desperate, uh, but as a resurrected God who we approach with reverence and respect when we understand just what he went through to be our Lord and Savior. Um, and so isn't that amazing? All right, Jesus was coronated through this process. Uh, but then there's the second thing I want everyone to take away um, that in this scene from the text today, we have the coronation of a disciple. And uh, again, I preached three or four weeks ago, and I spent a lot of time to explain that Mark has two primary objectives in his book. Mark wants to tell the world that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Kings, and that they should place their faith in him to receive forgiveness of sins, have his Holy Spirit in them, have eternal life in him, uh, as I've been preaching about. But furthermore, Mark has a, another, a second primary theme uh, that he's been talking about, if, that I emphasized a few weeks ago. Uh, if you read the beginning of the book and read through, you see that all throughout the book, he's trying to teach what true discipleship is. Um, what is a victorious life of discipleship? What does that look like? Uh, and the, the summary is found in Mark 8.34. Uh, he gives clear requirements for a disciple. Uh, it says, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so let me just ask, at this point in this chapter, where are the 12 disciples? How well have they done? according to this standard, deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. Uh, at this point, they've, they've all failed, right? One has betrayed Jesus, that's Judas. One has denied Jesus, that's Peter. We talked a lot about that last week. And all the others have run away in fear and shame uh, after Jesus was arrested. Um, but what God shows us in this text is that his standard uh, stays the same. Uh, to be a disciple of Christ, one must deny themselves and come after him and take up the cross daily and follow him. And that, that doesn't change. And uh, Mark has a technique here. Uh, we don't see the disciples here present in this chapter, but who do we see? We see outsiders, uh, an outsider stepping up to the call of discipleship. Um, uh, you know, the insiders who walked with him for three years, who knew him intimately, uh, some of his family members, the disciples, they're all gone. Uh, but throughout Mark, we see outsiders heeding the call to discipleship, uh, to repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus. Uh, we see um, the maniac of Gadira. The, we see blind Bartimaeus. We see the Syrophoenician women. Uh, our text here tells us in verse 21, uh, Jesus uh, is struggling to carry the cross. And so the Roman guards, they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And what, this is Simon's coronation as a disciple, as he bears Jesus' cross. What does he do? He immediately takes it up. Uh, and that's, that's amazing, right? The, the religious guys, the disciples, those who have been, they've actually committed miracles in Jesus' name at this point. They're not willing to be there for him. But this random guy, Simon of Cyrene, a foreigner, um, probably not a Jew, probably a man of color, uh, he's there. He heeds the call uh, and obeys uh, instantly. Right? Jesus is teaching us that the coronation for a disciple, uh, for coronation for him was taking up his cross, and also that the coronation for a disciple following after him is taking up the cross. And so Simon, he probably 
had to take it because Jesus was too weak, probably lost a lot of blood during the scourging. Um, and he, he shows us, he models for us how God coronates his disciples. And I, I, this is a little bit of a lesson and jab at those who have been churched, who've been in the church for a while. You know, we hesitate uh, this, uh, with this juxtaposition of a new guy I had no history with Jesus, just heeding the call instantaneously. You know, we tend to say, Lord, I've served you this much. The cross is too heavy for me to bear. Sometimes added responsibility, sometimes conflict that we've engaged, hardship, rejection that we've faced and bear in our cross. We say it's too hard. That's not for us. But we're to follow this man, um, Simon, uh, in taking up our cross. Uh, and view it not with bitterness, but with joy. View it as a blessing. View it as an honor. And we, we understand that Simon did that because uh, Mark goes on to write about um, uh, how the text mentioned his sons, Alexander and Rufus. Uh, from this moment, Simon built a gospel legacy of faith in Jesus Christ, and it continued in his family. Uh, we don't why do we know this? Uh, because Mark, he's writing to Christians in Rome. Uh, and we don't know anything about Alexander. We don't really know much about Simon. But we know that there was a man in the church of Rome who was called Rufus. Paul writes in Romans 16, 13, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother has been a mother to me as well. And so we see Simon takes the call to discipleship. He teaches, most likely, this Rufus mentioned in Romans, his son, the call. Uh, and we're all called to view these crosses that we bear in life as our coronation, as a blessing to walk and reign as Jesus did when he bore his cross. Um, scripture heeds, Paul calls us uh, to, to assume a mindset that the crosses that we bear uh, that are often the means of our humiliation in this life are the means of our exaltation before God. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we're to assume that the crosses that we bear uh, are, are a part of our coronation. It's the, the assurance that we are saved in Jesus. It's the assurance that we have the Lord's might and power working in us and through us when we take up our cross. Uh, there's another um, example uh, to sh emphasize this point. The coronation of a disciple is taking up one's cross. Uh, verse 27 says, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And this is, this, these, this verse should trigger the memory of uh, those of us who have been walking through Mark the past several months, uh, there's a point where two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, part of his inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John, Peter, uh, I said Peter twice, um, they say in 1037, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in glory. So James and John, they wanted to sit with Jesus when he entered in his reign in glory. Their perception was that uh, you know, when Jesus was stepping into glory, that his throne was a crown. But they didn't realize it was a tree, a cross. Uh, Jesus responds to them, it's not in his power to give them a place of power, but he can give them something else. Verse 38, Jesus said to them, you know, do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not to mine, mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And so it was these convicts 
um, in the moment. Uh, but for what this text again says is that what can Jesus offer to James and John? What was at his right hand and his left? A cross. And that's what we as Christians are offered when we follow Jesus Christ. And actually the Lord, these are crowning moments that assure our salvation, that the Lord uses to sanctify us, to grow us, to mature us, to be more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. These are moments when we bear crosses where we are reigning with him. We are walking into the world as conquerors, spreading his rule and his reign. And uh, Paul tells us, uh, if we suffer, we will reign with him. 2 Timothy 2, 11 says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So we are installed, we're coronated as disciples through our suffering. We reign through suffering. Uh, we reign through carrying crosses. And as I say that, um, we walk toward our close, I ask you, what crosses are you bearing for Jesus Christ? What is your view of those crosses? Are they burdens? Are they sources of bitterness? Are they causes that bring you to self-pity? Are they causes that cause you, do they cause you to dwell in anger? Or do you bear these crosses with hope and faith that the Lord could be using you to spread his rule and reign? The Lord could be using them to sanctify you, to grow you. The Lord could be using them to grow your appreciation of the cross that Jesus Christ bore for you and therefore grow your love uh, and desire to praise and worship him. You know, do you view these crosses as, as a blessed moment, as a coronation? And what are the crosses that you bear? I think a, a way, great application of the text is, what has the Lord called you to? What are the callings that you've stepped into for the name of Jesus? You know you didn't do them in the pursuit of idolatry. You don't know you didn't do it in rebellious sin. You said, Lord, I know you've called me to this by the circumstances of my life or the specific leading that you've put on my heart or through the church or through direct teachings of your word. What are those crosses? And so for a lot of people, how do you bury your singleness? That's a calling for a lot of people. You know, the world frames singleness to live for yourself, live for your own glory instead of God's. But Scripture says, no, live for Jesus, live for his glory. Do you bear that and make the sacrifices, the social, the financial, um, all of them, uh, do you bear those with joy and hope that the Lord will, will be with you in them? In your singleness, as someone may be desiring marriage, do you, in that struggle where the Lord has not given you a spouse yet, um, are you patiently enduring in that? Are you viewing it as a stumbling block in your life? Is it causing you to be paralyzed in the development of your faith? Or are you viewing it, are you seeing it as an opportunity to show the world that I can be satisfied first and foremost in Jesus Christ? He delivers. He always delivers. Even if, I don't get, even if I get married one day, that person will never deliver like him. You're married. You're called to be a head. You're called to be a leader, to lay yourself down like Jesus every day. And the bride you're called to lay down to doesn't submit that well. You're tempted towards just overpowering. You're tempted towards paralysis. Are you receiving this calling? This good calling, a good desire, a good position to step into as you pursue fruitfulness in it. Are you viewing it as a source of bitterness, something that's holding you back? Or are you viewing it as an opportunity to show Jesus to the world through your marriage? Are you someone called to submit in marriage and you realize your head is not worthy of headship? They're imperfect for that role. They stumble all the time. You could do a lot of what they do, make a lot of the decisions in a better way. Are you doing it in an angry, nagging manner? Are you impatient as they grow in that role? Or are you viewing it as an opportunity to show the world what loving submission is, uh, what helping truly is? 
Um, are you a member of the church? And you see it's hard to submit to elders. It's hard to be a member and see imperfect men who really need God's grace daily grow, struggle, stumble in their calling sometimes. You're called to stay for seasons in that. And do you view it as just something that you want to get rid of? Or do you view it as an opportunity to glorify God? John 13 says, the world should know the church by your love for one another. Uh, a lot of us, we, we need to realize that we as individuals, Jesus bore his cross. He, crowns, he was crowned with his cross. As individuals, we're crowned by our crosses. As a body, we're crowned by our crosses. It's really easy to be a community of people uh, that stay, that continue to gather together, that stay in relationship with one another, to bear with one another, to have love cover a multitude of sins and forgive one another when everything's going well. And we're a 12-year-old church. Mosaic Boston from 2011, I was there when it's 15 people, through 2020, it was growth. 10 to 550 in that period. And then we face COVID. We face worldly international struggle. We face internal struggle and disagreements that we've never encountered before. We face challenges. We face growing pains. We face sin. But if we can, we're not truly a church until we show ourselves capable of, of living and loving one another after the pipe dream that the church is going to be a place of perfection is broken. It's really when we can love one another, bear with one another in such moments that we show ourselves to be people of grace. People laying themselves down, laying their pride down, laying their preferences down for the good of God and for the good of brother and sister and neighbor around them. Right? A lot of what's I began the service asking, what does the victorious Christian life look like? It looks like a life full of cross-bearing. What does a victorious church look like? It looks like a life full of cross-bearing. The Lord is going, by our sin, we're going to engage crosses and struggles. By the Lord's appointment, we are just going to enter seasons of growth, seasons of challenge, seasons of maturation, uh, seasons inflicted upon us from the outside that are just going to cause the crosses to bear. And that, we, we we're not going to be a perfect institution that has a publicly correct image before all the large institutions around us. We're not going to be an institution that's always going to have unlimited growth. We're not going to be an institution that's always going to have perfect unity. Ideally, what is the source of our unity is that we all need grace at the cross of Jesus Christ. But we should be able to overcome those differences by, by bearing with one another, by seeing that the Lord is going to appoint such crosses for us and enduring them patiently, quietly, like Jesus did, prayerfully, like Jesus did in this chapter. And so the victorious church is not a perfect community. And so as we come to a close, um, as you process Christ's victory in his suffering, your victory in your suffering, the church's victory in your suffering, the question is, can you give him the glory and praise and worship through it all? Because Jesus, if anyone had the opportunity to lash out, if anyone was worthy to lash out and cry out and say, this isn't fair, I can't, I just can't do it anymore. If anyone had the uh, the righteousness to say, God, I don't deserve this. I'm not going forward with it. It was him. But instead, he, he kept the sovereign perspective that the cross that he bore was from, from the Lord. He kept functioning with a desire to want to honor and glorify him. And so can we do that as Jesus coronates us with our crosses? Let's close with that. Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for your word. We thank you for the cross. Um, we thank you, Lord, that as we look upon the cross, 
we don't look at it as a symbol of defeat. We look at it as a symbol of victory. We look at it as just, we look at it as the center of history, the cross point, the connection point that brings you and us together uh, despite our imperfections. Uh, Lord, we thank you for offering us hope. We thank you for offering us righteousness in Jesus. We thank you for offering us the crosses that you provide for us that cause us to grow in our faith in you, our dependence on you, grow in our vision to see how your spirit will wisely help us identify the narrow way forward. Uh, Lord, help us to have a new heart as we face the challenges and callings uh, that are difficult in the road ahead. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.